you are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where industry leaders, regulators, and lovers of cannabis gather collectively to move policy forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. Professionals and Canacurious alike can tune in to hear leading cannabis experts share and discuss headlines, critical industry issues, social topics, and more. The State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. Hi, and welcome to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where we bring you all the top stories you need to know and talk about them for four minutes and 20 seconds. Our news is bite-sized and infused with a nice mix of facts, opinions, and a pinch of humor. It's Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. This is episode 186. I'm Susan Sores, the founder of the State of Cannabis News Hour and Conference, author of the children's book, What's Growing in Grandma's Garden, and Cannabis's Favorite Grandma, AKA Nanogram. Today we're talking about cannabis and autism, the Global Health Summit, the art of the modern cannabis party, Louisiana gets access to expensive flour, Governor Buzzkill in Virginia, Big growth projected for 2022, rolling joints like a rock star, and many other frosty nuggets. So stay tuned for the full 60 minutes of the State of Cannabis News Hour. The following program contains coarse language and nudity. Viewer discretion is advised. Audience, feel free to raise your hands if you want to weigh in on a headline after it's been read, and we'll try to bring you up to the stage. Keep it brief and relevant, or you may get the gong. I'm going to start the show off today with a story because I want to make sure it gets covered. It's super important to me. Uh, My hope is that this year, 2022, is going to be a year full of research results confirming what most of us have known instinctually. I predict there's going to be a lot of stories like this in the future. It comes from Israel 21, and the headline is Cannabis Oil Effective in Treating Autism Lab Trial Show. So researchers from uh, Tel Aviv University alleviated symptoms of autism in Adam animal models with medical cannabis oil improving both behavioral and biochemical parameters of autism. As described in translational psychiatry, the researchers administered cannabis oil to animals with a mutation in the shank 3 gene that's associated with about 1% of autism cases. We saw that cannabis oil has a favorable effect on compulsive and anxious behaviors in model animals, says Shainai Poleg, the PhD student who led the research. According to the prevailing theory, autism involves over arousal of the brain, which causes compulsive behavior. Which component of cannabis oil most effectively alleviated the symptoms of autism? Surprisingly, it was THC, which they add is responsible for the euphoric high associated with the use of cannabis. This is the thing that's always bothered me. It's like, oh, it has this side effect, euphoria. Oh no, we can't have that. So this this is such a beautiful trial. So here's a quote from Poleg. She says, clinical trials testing cannabis treatments for autism usually involve strains containing large amounts of CBD due to this substance's anti-inflammatory property and because it does not produce a sense of euphoria. Moreover, the strains used for treating autism usually contain very little THC due to apprehension regarding both the euphoria and the possible long-term side effects. However, CBD alone had no impact on the behavior of the model animals. Treatment with cannabis oil containing THC but not CBD, produces equal or even better behavioral and biochemical effects. I am so excited about this. What do you guys think? It's been a long time coming. Right. I'm glad we're getting, getting more and more um, actual scientific base, scientific based results. And uh, more and more studies are coming out showing that it is the cannabis is, in fact, medicine. Man. Well, heaven, for, heaven forbid that... Uh, uh, people with autism experience euphoria. I've been following this and uh, uh, the whole autism study because it really affects my family. Um, and the Bonnie 
um, Goldstein out in California says the same thing. A little bit of THC really enhances the overall uh, function of the medicine and people shouldn't be afraid of it. Amen. Uh, Troy, did you want to weigh in? This is so spectacularly awesome. I am in tears almost. I deal with so many autism patients and their parents and to have something resourced of knowledge to go to is awesome and to help them and I'm just happy to see this. Yeah, I think we're going to see more and more of it because we all know that uh, that all the compounds are amazing. The whole plant, that's where it's at, right? Well, the THC and the CBD do different things. Some, like the THC attaches to the receptors, whereas the CBD primarily helps um, prevent the breakdown of THC. So there are different chemicals doing different things with the body. So we can't just say, oh, this one's good, we want to use that one and not this one because, oh, somehow it's bad. They have different functions within the body. You're you're a hundred percent right, Anna. But one other one other point to that is that CBD does not activate without the presence of THC. So all of these CBD companies that claim X, Y, and Z that actually doesn't do anything but selling snake oil to the general public. It reminds me of the Rick Simpson days when he boldly came out and said he does, believes THC is the cancer killer. It's all about the entourage effect. Ensemble. Effect. Uh, entourage is an amazing show and okay. should still be on the air. <laughs> Turtle for president. Uh, I do miss it, but yes. Just to clarify, it doesn't work as effectively pretty much without the presence of other cannabinoids and terpenes. Exactly, Priscilla. It doesn't work. Well. <laughs> Shane, did you want to uh, give us the last word? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, it's good to know that they're finding good ways to contribute to other um, health issues. And I can actually attest to the THC part when my son, about 10 years ago, he's 15 now, about 10 years ago when he was sick, I actually would like for nausea, instead of giving him medicine because he was too young, I would like blow just a little bit, just blow across his nose. And it would help him with his nausea. So I can definitely agree and attest to it helping children. So hopefully, you know, we'll progress more and more as they find out things that they're testing. Hold on, Shane. Did you say that you put blow on their nose? No, I would blow Jason. a little bit of smoke. Jason, don't nose. make it worse. Behave Did yourself. You <laughs> Was it cannabis? No, no, no. <laughs> and, and Shane, il allegedly, correct. Right. Allegedly. Allegedly. Ten years ago. Uh, 10 that years was ago. a natural remedy that I can attest to that word. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we're, we're at time on this headline, so we're going to keep moving. Give it up for co-producer Priscilla Agoncillo. She's a Canamamipreneur, multi-award-winning influencer, CEO of the award-winning Original Breeders League, and a smoking superhero. She's known for keeping elected officials accountable and having the best weed east of California and in California. What you got, Priscilla? Thank you, Susan. So I have a fun article today. Uh, it is learn how to roll a joint like a rock star with LA Roots. So this article covers professional joint rolling um, with help from legendary singer, songwriter and stoner David Crosby. He's a man with decades of cannabis smoking experience under his belt. He's a rocker who knows how to roll. But over the last few years, he has also earned a reputation for doling out cannabis advice through a long Long running column in Rolling Stone magazine called Ask Cross. Uh, he also critiques uh, different posts on social media of different joints that are uh, submitted to him. So he's a really fun member of the community. Uh, although now Crosby's preferred consumption method is through a vaporizer, specifically PAX. Um, he's using PAX just to kind of help maintain his, his vocals uh, as he is a performer. So uh, in this article, he talked about his lifelong love of cannabis and how he became the Beatles ganja go-to uh, while in LA, and also his plans to create his own authentic celebrity cannabis brand. The thing that I liked 
about this article is how he points out celeb brands are mostly bullshit and how there's a real culture around cannabis that needs to be spoken to and specific targets to hit that are important to the cannabis culture in order to be a successful and sustainable brand. Here are some clips of the interview. He plans to take advantage of his status as one of the world's most iconic weed consumers by launching a cannabis brand called the Mighty Cross. While news of the brand has already caused buzz nationwide, there's no product behind the label yet because Crosby and his partner are waiting for the federal prohibition against pot to ease. Tell me about your move into the cannabis space, the Mighty Cross. So you and Steven Sponder have partnered on, you have a brand and you're looking for brand partners we sat down and we looked at it we've got a we've got a thing to sell that's me being one of the best known pot smokers in america i figure the best known is willie after that's probably snoop and then it's probably me my business the- we've got a thing to sell that is hysterical did, did this guy just say that he's number two to snoop as far as recognition he said he said he's number three after uh willie then snoop and, and who him. is this yeah. person <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Who the fuck is this dude? <laughs> oh my god. Uh here's another one. You're gonna love this one, Jason. When we evolve the strain that we're gonna be famous for, the Mighty Cross, mm-hmm. I know which strains I'm gonna pull it from. Mm-hmm. You know, I know which I know what I'm looking for. We don't give us a roadmap, just a no. you just would rather No, no, there's some secret stuff it's in it. It's like there. it's like here's... Mighty Cross will be a very strong pot. Okay. I'll tell you that. It's gonna be a very strong pot. It's gonna be a very strong pot. So does that mean it's gonna be like fifty percent THC based off of the COA? <laughs> uh, it's gonna be cast it's gonna be cast it's iron. It's gonna be it's the uh, gumbo, remember? <laughs> strong pots go ahead califari did you want to weigh in oh yeah i I did i i think uh david crosby's more famous for freebasing cocaine than smoking cannabis um (laughs) that's that's thank you hold on well is is that david crosby that actually said that no but uh but i i've met david crosby i grew up in Bryn county and uh my stepdad was the doctor who got him into rehab in the 80s for smoking cocaine that that's hysterically funny because I remember meeting with him at the beginning of legalization and him wanting to do a brand and him wanting an exorbitant amount of money up front just to use his name and likeness on a brand. And we basically laughed him out of the room. That's so funny, Jason, because at the end of this, um, this little clip he's he's teaching this la times guy how to roll a joint. And after he's done, he goes, that'll be 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the maybe that's the secret ingredient. Well, <laughs> to the um, strongest pot. There right. was a lot of saliva well, involved. If you're if you're rolling a joint with a bill, you should only use hundreds. Unless you're in LA, then that shit's laced with coke. That just adds standard. an extra terpene profile to uh, to the mix, Priscilla. But not fentanyl. That would be appropriate for Crosby's brand. <laughs> I was not expecting this reaction uh, to this story because, because you know, uh, I thought he's pretty famous, but I guess he's not. And it doesn't he's really not. matter. I mean, you know, not. yeah, it doesn't matter. So, but he, they're waiting until um, it's federally legal. So Bing Crosby uh, is more famous than David Crosby. <laughs> oh man, you guys are brutal. All right. Up next is Rico Lameet. He likes to ask the tough questions that the mainstream media refuses to ask. The self-proclaimed dopest dad alive is also a superstar at cracking dad jokes. Find him on TEDx or at one of his Cannavision events, but always find him here every weekday as co-producer of the State of Cannabis News Hour. What do you have for us, Rico? All right, so I'm coming out of the Weed blog, and it's BIPOC Cannabis Medical Association announces Global Health Summit. So as a former high level athlete, I knew damn well what the consequences were every time that I chose to consume cannabis, uh, but I still chose to do it. Back in high school, it was more of a social thing. When I played in Big Ten college football, it was actually a medical, I was actually a medical consumer without knowing it. Um, You know, to recover from games, to relieve stress, long academic weeks piled on to 5 a.m. workouts, 6.30 a.m. film sessions, full course load all day, ending with practice and another film session. Yeah, that shit sucked. And cannabis was always there to keep me sane. 
Um, I never got caught for a few reasons that I will not discuss today. Um, but subconsciously, I was choosing my own health over a system that really didn't give a fuck about anything um, but my own field production. And that's a problem. Athletes have long been banned from cannabis consumption for a myriad of bullshit reasons. And uh, this article points out possible health risks, uh, performance enhancement, violating the spirit of sport is just a few. Uh, but times are changing. Athletes are now beginning to openly embrace its health and wellness potential. And I'm so damn proud to announce that Saturday, January 22nd, 2022, as we are now, uh, my extended family over at the Association of Cannabis Health and uh, Medicine, ACAM, will be looking to advance cannabis integration into sports medicine by bringing together over 300 athletes, educators, uh, coaches, students, and sports enthusiasts from all across the country. The United States Cannabis Council, USCC and uh, Marijuana Policy Pro uh, Project, MPP, have come on board as title sponsors uh, for ACAM's one-day virtual summit, uh, providing educational and informational programming curated by ACAM and coalition partners. For the Weed Blog, uh, the Global Health Summit Athletes Association is the second event in the ACAM Global Health Summit a series, seeking to build awareness and competency in the medical and clinical applications of cannabis science for athletes, coaches, sports enthusiasts, and associations that support them. The goal of the virtual summit is to foster learning, inspire thought leadership, and prompt more conversations about achieving health equity in sports. Notice I didn't say social equity. Uh, 2021 lit a fire under the collective asses of uh, the global athletic community, sparking conversations about cannabis's role in athletics historically, presently, and speculation about where its place will be in the future. As it stands, sports organizations and the rules banning cannabinoids are out of date, out of touch, and none of them are based upon any kind of science. In fact, the stigma is a lot closer tied to racism than we actually, and we now actually have historical data proving that. Uh, whether you're a fan of hers or not, the world-class sprinter Shakari Richardson and her very public drama last year was a tipping point after being stripped of her position on the US uh, Olympic team for using cannabis to manage her own mental health. Um, as noted in this article around the same time, Mendy, a CBD brand founded by Olympian and a U.S. women's uh, soccer team superstar uh, Megan Rapino uh, was launched to much public fanfare. Uh, Rapino explained she uses CBD almost exclusively for mental health and pain management. And without diving back into that whole debate on whether it applies to apples and oranges or not, um, just know that a lot of positive has come from it. And plenty of pro athletes of all colors uh, are looking to move forward on the conversation. ACAM's Global Health Summit is here to make sure everyone gets floor seats. Uh, the summit is on Saturday, January 22nd uh, from 9 to 5 p.m. Pacific, 12 to 8 p.m. Eastern. And um, I can't wait for it. I'll be part of it. So uh, this is Rico Lamite, 2022 Dope Dad Candidate of the Year. Uh, Dope Dad of the Year candidate yet again and proud member of the Chem Coalition reporting live for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Back to you, Susan. Did you, is this online or is this in, in person? Yeah. yeah, it'll be online. Let me actually, I'll shoot you the link uh, for everything. But yeah, it'll be online uh, Saturday, January 22nd. And it'll be all day. We have a lot of huge names in the athletic community uh, where have, we bring on a couple of really, really big uh, surprise um, appearances there. And it's, it's, it's an open conversation uh, based in science, uh, based in uh, experience. And um, it'll be very, very eye opening uh, to see what some people have to say across the board. Rico, I heard you spell that huge with a Y. <laughs> you heard wrong, brother. You heard wrong. It's huge. Isn't that how Bernie Sanders says it? Bernie Sanders doesn't say anything but communism communism works. I I love this. I love this. I can't wait to attend it. Um I was really disappointed that the uh industry turned more to adult use and I I want to support anything that we can uh to really uh highlight the medicinal qualities of cannabis yeah one, one, one million percent and um yeah just get these athletes away from these opioids man it's, it's a it's a problem that i dealt with uh, my addiction issues um numerous friends of mine are still dealing with it and um it just needs to change uh, there are better ways to deal with the pain there are better uh, ways to deal with the stress and cannabis is one of them and we have science and um medical research backing those uh facts as well I think this is also very timely, especially what we saw with the Olympics and a lot of other athletes and 
people um, dealing with this. So I'm really glad to see that this is being brought forward. Thank you for this great story, Rico. I hope great they story, have. Rico. I hope they have a panel on the side effect of euphoria. Um, Mary, did you want to weigh in? Oh, thank you. Yeah, echoing what everybody else is saying, this is overdue. It's a great project. I'd be happy to contribute in in any way that you uh, that you think I could help. We do have good research that cannabis doesn't increase the amount of oxygen that you extract from your blood or the or the size or quality of your respirations. It doesn't strengthen your you know the biceps uh, strength, uh, you know, with using cannabis or not using cannabis, but it certainly helps athletes with the stress and the pain and, and the performance anxiety, which is tremendous. And uh, it, it's, it's a valuable addition and needs to start being uh, acknowledged and accepted and approved by all of these organizations. So I think this is right on track. I love it. I just want to say that the euphoric effect in, in all of it, Susan, is extremely dangerous. And it's one of the reasons why people should not drive and smoke weed. Because there's, they're going to have a big smile on because their face? Because it prevents road rage. Well, Dr. Mary, I'll, I'm going to hit you up today. Um, and we can, we can, I can connect you with the rest of the team over there. Hit me up. We'd love to have you. We'd love to have you part of it. We'll get the link out uh, in the newsletter this week so that everyone can attend. But click on that link at the top of the page and sign up. But uh, we're time on this. Let's keep smoking the news. The cannabis industry's very own Nora Jones, Lara DeCaro. What you got for us today, Lara? Okay. Sorry, Liz. <laughs> Hi, Rico. Thank you for that amazing introduction. I have COVID for you today. So just in case you're wondering, yes, I am now a statistics. Thank you all. Um, but I have an article <laughs> about pricing and um, cultivation out of Paraguay. It's a pretty interesting one. It's called Cannabis Price Drop Creates Opportunity for Paraguay by Ken Parks for Bloomberg, which was published in the Buenos Aires Times. It starts off as cannabis starts to behave more like an agricultural commodity, there's a race to find the best growing climate at the lowest cost. In South America, a new candidate is emerging, Paraguay. Uh, Paraguay currently limits its licenses, it should be noted, to 12 locals who won them in 2020. But medical cannabis exporter Sea Plant Switzerland, which touts itself as a fully integrated cannabis and hemp company, expects to acquire at least one licensed producer in Paraguay in early 2022 to produce THC rich flour and extracts for the company's Swiss based laboratory. Their CEO, Lucas. Crivillon said, I probably slaughtered that. If cannabis prices keep falling, sea plant may shift most of its farming from Uruguay to Paraguay, where operating costs are allegedly 50% lower, he said. Well, I looked up sea plants financials, and it looks like they um, run a really lean ship. They've raised what those of us in the United States may deem a really modest seed round of $3 million in 2019, and they're looking to raise another $4 million right now, if anybody's interested. Um, but they, like other cannabis exporters, the article points out, probably face several years of falling prices as growing volumes of low-cost production from Mediterranean and South Hemisphere countries hit the market. Apparently, Paraguay has inexpensive electricity, low wages, and established pharmaceutical industry that give it a chance to compete here. So the shift into THC uh, for this company comes as prices are dropping for their CBD products. Crivellone is quoted as saying he expects prices for CBD flour in the European Union to fall about 20% this year from their current range of U.S. $300 to U.S. $700 a kilogram. Prices for CBD flour already declined to 20% in 2021 from the previous year, he has said. So Sea Plant apparently sources all of its cannabis from 44 hectares, which is almost 110 acres, farmed by what they call associate producers. Um, the company apparently provides the, the farmers with seeds, licenses, and technical assistance. And this move into Paraguay would add another 5 hectares or 12 acres to that number. He said, we are convinced that this will be the dominant model, Chief Strategy uh, Officer sorry, Guido Husni said. Farming requires a lot of work and investment. We completely exited that part of the business to focus on our retail sales and finished products, he said. 
Seaplant's also lobbying the Uruguayan government to authorize the production and export of psilocybin and mushrooms for medicinal purposes, they said. So I thought this was pretty interesting because it demonstrates, you know, the economics at work, the importance of cultivation in the supply chain, but really, you know, the, the devaluation of that agricultural commodity, as I like to say, and I'd love to hear what my fellow correspondents have to say about that. My name is Laura DeCarl. I'm reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Seems like there's a race to find cheap labor, uh, which is sad, but also, I mean, when you... Well, I guess they're adding to their their uh, total square footage, but you know, it seems like moving would be expensive. Um, if if you're, but these guys are these guys are growing, but you know, cheap labor. Okay, yeah. let's. Yeah. It's 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 agricultural exploitation at its best on the you know a worldwide economic scale. It just continues. It's just it's now in um, cannabis. I mean, it's nothing new necessarily, right? For for the cannabis industry, but now more on a global sanctioned scale. Um, I think what these guys might do is, you know, concentrate efforts, eventually close down the more expensive grow facilities and concentrate um, on growing in really cheap climates. And if you can grow in Paraguay and, and ship it to Switzerland for extraction and processing halfway across the world, uh, and it's still cheaper, there's a problem. Yeah, man. It, I think it's all about perspective. And from our perspective, yeah, it, it, it does suck. It will bring money into their economies as well. The global supply chain is fucked up, but regardless of how you look at it, and we're just at a, a point of privilege, and we see it as really shitty for those people, but they see it as an opportunity. Yeah, Paraguay is basically like the Oklahoma, South America. It's just a very bizarre country with a really it's been too long under a dictatorship it's out now but and if you're talking about genetics and weather and and labor costs are affordable it's colombia there's just no comparison so and they're already working with the canadians so i think it's i don't know it's kind of a non-story i think honestly i heart cheap labor well uh thank you so much for sharing that article laura and up next we have our very own liz rogan Liz is a cannabis educator. She is a brand strategist and healthcare consultant. She's also founder of the Cannabis Business Council of Santa Barbara County. At any moment, she is probably doing yoga on her paddleboard. Liz, what do you have us for us today? Good morning. Thanks so much, Priscilla. Happy first Tuesday of 2022, everyone. Thanks for being here with us today. My story comes from the Daily Advertiser, which is a local Louisiana publication out of Lafayette, Louisiana. This story comes from Greg Hilburn. The headline reads, patients line up for Louisiana's first smokable medical marijuana and balk at the prices. So there's a couple news articles that uh, talk about this, but some of them are guarded by paywall. So I pulled this information here for you. So starting yesterday, Monday, Louisianans who are medical cannabis patients can access actual cannabis flower, albeit with many caveats, and patients are recording high costs. So for a while, cannabis-infused products and oil were available, but raw cannabis flowers were not. Um, the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry approved 193 pounds for sale from two farms only. One is Louisiana State University's Good Day Farm, and the other is Southern University's partner, Ilera Holistic Healthcare. Only three strains are available also, Mandarin Cookies, Man Mandarin Z Skittles, and Grease Monkey. So about 150 pounds of that flour is now available at the nine cannabis pharmacies, as they call them, across the state. And that amount works out to nearly uh, 20,000 eighth ounce servings. And this is the first batch that's actually been approved by the regulators. They say that bigger shipments are on the way, but the companies are holding some back to see what demand looks like in the first week. And they have 300 more pounds waiting to be tested, including two additional strains. So soon we'll get five. Wow. As of the third quarter of last year, there were um, 14,663 medical cannabis patients. So it doesn't sound like they're gonna get very much each. Uh, patients and industry sources uh, reported prices are ranging from 10 to $25 a gram, depending on the pharmacy and the strain. And this is the first time retailers have had lines out the store. Customers are looking for safer, cleaner products. 
and they're excited to try these. But they say that they're feeling kind of gypped. They're saying it should be cheaper, but it's more than double the street price. Uh, Delta Medmar was charging $440 to $480 an ounce, according to a price sheet. And one ounce is uh, generally enough for 84 pre-rolled uh, joints, according to this article. Um, they're saying a cost for an eighth of the flour across the state ranged from $35 to $80. Um, neither farm, uh, Good Day Farms or Holistic Healthcare, provided information on wholesale prices because the growers are focused on making sure the wholesale pricing is consistent with other states, even though they're not in the mature market. But research does show if the retail price isn't within 20% of the illicit market, most people will continue to buy from it. So wholesale growers have no control over these retail prices, and the retailers say the pricing will drop as the market matures. When there's more patients and more products are available, um, they say it will be cheaper. But Republican State Representative Tanner McGee, who actually sponsored this legislation, is concerned about the early pricing reports. But we'll watch it to see if more adjustments need to be made because... Uh, one of the primary reasons to expand the options in the program was to make the medicine more affordable and accessible. So this is Liz Rogan reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Is anyone in Louisiana? Um, what do you guys have to say? Yes, if you're in Louisiana, please raise your hand and tell us what's going on. No booth comments, Jason? Well, we all know it's booth because she grows weed in Santa Barbara, but that's besides the point. No, 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 in Louisiana. <laughs> Come on. <gasps> oh, Ouch. you're bad. Wow. <laughs> Liz, give it to him. Give it Do to it. I just want to say give that I got some photos from Santa Barbara County Cannabis to Getty Images to help improve these stock photos. So I'll keep you posted on that, Jason. Fantastic. I mean, uh, Lakeisha, yeah. let's, let's hear from Lakeisha and then Rico. Hi, guys. I actually worked for Alira Holistic Healthcare until recently, and um, it's been interesting. The price point has been a point of contention for the longest time. Um, but when you only have two medical marijuana licenses and they're only two, the two ag centers that are in the state, you really don't have a whole lot of competition. So you can set it pretty much wherever you want. Um, which is kind of bad for patients, which is why we have like less than 5,000 um, medical marijuana card holders in the state. So uh, yeah, it's been pretty interesting um, in this market. So definitely, I mean, we've been fighting for flour. We've been um, constantly doing those amendments through the legislature to make sure that we can move from you know, just certain diseases, illnesses, what have you, into any illness or debilitating disease, into any doctor can um, prescribe, well, recommend is what we have to say. Um, it was a fight just to get the meter dose inhaler. So now that we're at flower and we're moving into the medical space, um, it's going to be pretty, pretty interesting because you don't have competition and that illegal market is still out there and it's still booming. So I would love to see some more reports on this and maybe six months to a year and revisit it and see how it looks. Please come back and, and uh, fill us in on what's going on. That was great that you could weigh in on that. Rico, did you want to get the last word in? Yeah, I was just going to say illegal yeah, prices are really where it's going to keep the trap alive, period. It's just too expensive. Yeah, yeah. $80 for an eighth, that's wild. All right, we missed the relight, so I'm gonna quickly relight the room. You are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. The thoughts and opinions expressed in the State of Cannabis News Hour are those of the individual speakers, not those of any other speaker, the State of Cannabis, or its members. The statements made in the State of Cannabis News Hour do not constitute legal or accounting advice, and the State of Cannabis and its speakers make no representation regarding the legal status of any substance in any country, area, or territory, or any other authorities. The views expressed in this room do not establish any fiduciary relationships. The sponsorship of the State of Cannabis News Hour do not imply or constitute any endorsement by the State of Cannabis or the expressions of any of the opinions whatsoever on the part of the State of Cannabis or any of its speakers. Viewer discretion advised. Let's keep smoking the news. Oh, uh, yeah. So up next, this Long Beach-based cannabis and intellectual property attorney is the head honcho of Fruit Slabs, and you can probably find him in the background of your favorite Entourage episodes. <laughs> up next, it's Brandon Dorsky. What you got for us this morning, my man? Thanks for having me. Today, my headline comes from Marijuana Moment. It's incoming Virginia governor won't overturn legal marijuana possession, 
but cast doubt on sales. Uh, just like the state's road maintenance crews can't seem to get their act together, it sounds like the incoming Republican regime is intentionally going to drag its feet and making sure the citizens of Virginia get the cannabis they need. Incoming Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin claims there is, quote, still work to be done before he gets behind Virginia's pending cannabis marketplace. Uh, advocates have already expressed fear that this Republican will interfere with the implementation of the cannabis legalization laws passed by Democrats because Youngkin's virtue signaling is really hard to ignore. He has made each of the following statements with respect to cannabis legalization. Quote, I'm not against it, but there's a lot of work to be done. Quote, concerns expressed by law enforcement and how the gap in laws can actually be enforced. There's a real need to make sure that we aren't promoting an anti-competitive industry. Another quote, there are preferences to make sure that all participants in the industry are qualified to do the industry well. Uh, another one, all for opportunities for minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and military-owned businesses. Uh, but we will also have to make sure that they have the capabilities to compete and thrive in the industry. So I think there's work to be done. All of that will be on the table. Again, I don't look to overturn the bill, but I think we need to make sure that it works. And last but not least, Youngkin said in April that he's, quote, never met anybody who habitually used marijuana and was successful. And in May, he said legalization was, quote, another problem that's going to be dumped at my feet. Legalization in Virginia passed along party lines last year without a single Republican voting in favor of the proposal on the floor of the Senate or Assembly. Both chambers were controlled by Democrats at the time. That is no longer the case. Some GOP legislators have given assurances they will not block sales, but Republican House Speakers Todd Gilbert and Glenn Davis have said the current system is not tenable. Gilbert has said specifically, quote, Democrats didn't do legalization the right way. And quote, we've been left with that live grenade kind of rolling around and we need to fix it or else all we have is a black market. Virginia legislature's marijuana oversight panel met in late 2021 and voted to expedite the timeline for launching retail sales by a year. But Youngkin is already resisting that suggestion, too, since sales are currently set to begin in 2024. Unfortunately for Virginians, the legislation that passed included a reenactment clause that requires legislators to hold another vote on the legalization proposal concerning commercial sales during this year's session in a now divided government. Low level possession and home cultivation already became legal last summer and are luckily not subject to the reenactment provisions. But we may not see a marketplace emerge there for quite some time, given Youngkin's virtual signaling. This is Brandon Dorsky reporting for the State of Cannabis. I was trying to do a dog whistle sound effect, but I couldn't hear it. I see what you did there, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. Uh, that was good. So are you saying who let the dogs out, Susan? No, I'm saying this guy is a scumbag. Do you have a reefer Maganus uh, sound effect, Susan? Yeah, I mean... Uh, I, hey, hey, I, I, hey, I would not, I would not to listen to everything... I would not I would not take that much stock in everything that marijuana moment is frankly putting out. All they're putting out is some conjecture. Uh, Glenn Youngkin is a businessman, so I do not see him uh, completely holding back um, legalization in Virginia. There will be sales. It may not be in the form that people wanted. There may not be social equity. There's going to be a whole lot of shit changing because the Republicans now have control. This is why Dems, when you have the power to get shit done, if you want it done, you got to do it when you can. Because when Republicans show up, they are going to make marijuana laws what they want them to be. And we need to remember this. This is Gretchen for State of Kansas. Gretchen, that's I that's could fire. not agree with you more on this. And that is one of the reasons that none of my stories are ever stories out of marijuana moment. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was I just... interesting that Youngkin's quotes about and comments about equity include military owned businesses and he is lumping those in with the other traditional equity applicants which i have not really seen in many other states if any who is winning votes like who is he getting with these quotes i mean these quotes seem extremely offensive to me i mean being from being from virginia like this is it just is what it is like a lot of people um, over the last, I'd say like 10 years or so, you see Virginia as a, a purple state or whatever. Nah, nah, man, that shit's fucking racist as fuck. It's South as fuck. The majority of the Confederate battles are fought in fucking Virginia. It was the capital of the Confederacy. Deal it's with the it. most Northern Southern state. Virginia is a very it is conservative the capital of the state. the fucking Confederacy. It's Outside. very conservative, period. Outside. 
outside of the major population base that you have in Northern Virginia around DC, it's a highly rural area. And the other next major population area would be Norfolk and Virginia Beach, which is all military, also conservative. And, um, and Yunkin's from uh, Loudoun County, which is probably the richest conservative county in all of fucking Virginia. And um, they hired him because he was anti-CRT and he was all about, you know, saving the children. So, well, if he if he's from Loudoun County, then, you know, he's going to ultimately be a cannabis supporter. <laughs> it's not it's it's he's not trash, dude. it's not that it's how he's going to do it. I mean, th- those statements were blatantly racist. Welcome Some to Virginia. Offensive. Offensive. Yeah. Let's keep smoking the news. Which ones were racist, Susan? Identify those. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'll I'll uh I'll put them in the chat. Go ahead. Let's keep smoking. Well, up next, who is smoking is Mr. Eric Hislerada. Uh, Eric is an industry writer, a brand building content ninja, and the fifth generation Californian and farmer's friend. Uh, Eric, what do you have for us today? Thank you for the intro, Priscilla. And hey, everybody, happy new year. Great to be here today. Uh, My headline is from Cannabis Now, and it's the art of the modern cannabis party. So hopefully everybody got in some sort of celebration over the holidays, even if it was just with your family and inner circle. But maybe that's whetted your appetite for attending or hosting an event in 2022, given that it's been almost two years since the pandemic put the brakes on many gatherings. Personally, I'm optimistic that we'll see cannabis live events heat up with the weather this spring, and so is Ricardo Baca, the writer of this piece and one of the founders of Grasslands, which was featured at San Francisco's Outside Lands in August 2019, and it was one of the first live events featuring licensed consumption and sales. Um, Most of the pointers in this article are kind of no-brainers, but I'm just happy to be talking about this topic. Again, the article uh, starts with an intro where Ricardo emphasizes others have fought for our right to party and points out that weed parties and events are different from ones serving alcohol. And I'm gonna say yes and no to that one, having done both. So again, there's nothing earth shattering here, but it's a quick, easy read and some items uh, to check off your list when you host your next weed-friendly gathering or event, which hopefully will be soon. So I'm quoting here, incorporate, incorporate different types of cannabis consumption. Not everyone smokes weed and not everyone enjoys edibles. So make sure you don't forget to consider that as you're stocking the cannabis bar for your next shindig. While some parties are built around a thoughtful selection of micro brews and spirits, successful cannabis events thrive on a variety of flour and a multitude of consumption devices, including a, literally a vaporizer for the light lunged. And I think something missing here is he could have mentioned multiple pipes or pre-rolls so folks don't have to share. Um, quoting again, clearly mark your edibles. I threw in an intimate holiday party a few years ago where multiple friends posted pictures of my modest, if comprehensive, edibles bar because I came up with a design they found both helpful and never before seen. A small bowl held edibles with 2.5 milligrams of THC, while a slightly larger bowl contained 5 milligram candies, and an even larger bowl held, held 10 milligram pieces. Um, that also tells me most of his friends like to go big. Uh, cater to your friend's social media addiction. A hand-drawn chalkboard menu at the, be- at the Bud Bar. A thoughtfully organized display of cannabis products. Simple twinkle lights in a house plant. A, f- a bouquet of fresh and fragrant flowers with cannabis flower intermingling with lilies and baby's breath. I don't know about that. Sounds kind of 90s prom era. Um, And then uh, the last pointer here, try something different. And I think the best advice in this section is the last line, cannabis opens minds, so take advantage and introduce your guests to something they might not be expecting. And that's what I got for you today. Um, Eric, for the State of Cannabis News Hour, thank you for having me up. I'm surprised they didn't mention, aren't there several products out there that uh, claim to be a buzzkill, like to, if you overindulge? Yeah, I mean, there's the whole citrus thing too, you know, that people talk about, but um, I just thought it's Ricardo Baca, and frankly, I thought, you know, he would be diving way deeper into events, because again, with his Grasslands connection, so... I was a little disappointed this. It was more like, oh my God, let's at least talk a little bit about events uh, and considering who he is and what he's pulled off in 2019. But, you know, (laughs) it is what it is. Yay, we've got Elise up on the stage. I'd love to hear what you have to say and and then Mary. 
Yeah. Hi, fam. Hashi New Year. Um, well, I wanted to help Eric out um, and give a correction. So Ricardo Baca is the founder of Grasslands. That's his PR agency. The founder of Grasslands at Outside Lands is actually Salwa Ibrahim, two totally different companies. So Salwa is the producer of the activation at the Outside Lands Music Festival and her company Highland Events is who does that. Ricardo's agency is again a PR firm based in Denver, but he does throw awesome parties. And um, yeah, I just wanted to offer that. Oh, thank correction. you, Lisa. I thought they worked You're together. Don't... No, I don't think so. Oh, not. they don't. Okay, cool. No. Well, then it, yeah. and now just I understand the why the article's not so good. And Saul yes. was amazing. She was. She pulled. She actually saved the Emerald Cup this year. The Harvest. I know ball. all about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so she's amazing. So props to her. Thanks. Elise, are there parties as good as Big Mike's parties? Absolutely way better. And you know, I love me some strippers, but Ricardo has tattoo artists at his party and they're a lot classier and less um, objectifying of women. So does that mean that everyone at their party leaves with a tattoo? No, tattoos are optional, but I did leave with a tattoo in Vegas in 2018. But did you leave with a stripper at Big, Big Mike's party? Just no, like and that's why Big Mike didn't get a full <laughs> 10 out of 10. <laughs> What Thank kind of, you what kind so of, much. What kind, of, what kind of strippers do you prefer, Elise? I'm inclusive. I like all strippers. Uh, let, <laughs> let's let's stay on topic. We've, I'm, we're at time, but I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you didn't have a stripper in your gift bag, Elise. All right, uh, Mary, then chemo, and then we need to move. Oh, I just wanted to express my concern that as these parties uh, progress, you know, we need to be careful about mixing alcohol and cannabis. That's one of the worst situations to put somebody behind the wheel under. And it also just has a, a less, uh, I mean, the outcomes are a little bit less reliable than just a purely cannabis party. Recognizing, too, that a lot of people at a cannabis party are also on mushrooms. And when I was at MJ Biz, everybody was pushing alcohol. At, at all of the individual parties. It's worrisome. Yeah, that will never happen, though, at an AB 2020 event, a licensed California event, because there's a firewall between alcohol and weed at the licensed parties. All right, Kimo, you want to give us the last word? <laughs> yeah, uh, be careful at a big mic party. The only thing you're going to leave with is a venereal disease and a hard drug Yikes! habit. Yikes! <laughs> oh, boy. There we go. Oh. Shots fired, Kimo. Quadruple yes. vax. Full of garbage. Oh, my God. It needs to be canceled. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Okay. I also want to say that uh, I have never experienced the negative effects of being crossfaded when I'm drinking 1942 with all of the above mentioned. Ooh. Hey, I, I, I'm with you, Priscilla. I have never been crossfaded either, but I have witnessed people that have been drinkers and have never consumed cannabis. And then they have an adverse reaction when they drink as in throwing up, but that's all that encumbers. All right. So he used to chase down suspects before reading their Miranda rights. Now he chases down the spiciest stories in Mary Jane news. That's right. He's a former cop and a cannabis security consultant at CC Security Solutions. Up next is Chris Eggers. What you got for us this morning, my brother? Good morning, Rico. Good morning, uh, everybody here in the room and on stage. My article today comes out of uh, San Leandro in the East Bay. Uh, KTV News reports that San Leandro police shot and injured suspects following a burglary at a cannabis dispensary. San Leandro, uh, let's see, uh, the, the injuries were non-life-threatening, police said, but on Sunday at about 10.40 p.m., uh, police responded to a burglar alarm that went off at Silver Streak, formerly Bloom, at 1915 Fairway Drive. Uh, witnesses called police to say that several suspects were running out of the business with masks on. And when police arrived, they saw a man wearing a mask running away from the dispensary. Police said that the man ran into a getaway infinity occupied by two others. And authorities said that the man got out, uh, man got a handgun. And that's when an office, an unnamed officer fired his duty weapon several times. Um, Radio communication over the air can be heard from police saying shots fired, all units code three. That means lights and sirens and breaking from any calls that you're on that aren't um, life uh, threatening calls or a priority or one priority calls. The armed man and a passenger had climbed over uh, and were both shot in the chest, said police Captain Ali Khan. A third sp suspect was uh arrested at the scene. Police did not identify any of the suspects and did not immediately release any body-worn camera footage. So uh, now, according to this report, the shooting will be investigated by St. Leandro Police Department and an outside independent investigator. Uh, having worked in Alameda County, I know that the Alameda County DA's office has a special um, 
unit to uh, investigate officer involved shooting. So that's going to take place as well. Um, that is my news for this Tuesday. My name is Chris Eggers, and I'm reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. So they were shot in the chest, but they're okay. According- According to this article, yeah, it said at the beginning of the article that the injuries were non-life-threatening, but then it said that uh, both were shot in the chest, likely taken to home hospital. It'll be a developing story for sure. Um, for sure. Let's go ahead and keep smoking the news so we can get through the last two stories. All right. Well, up. Uh, thank you for sharing that horrible story, Chris. Um, with would love an update on that. Up next, we have the state of cannabis's very own Kaiser Soze. He is the longest continuous retailer of cannabis in California, and he is my party spirit animal. Uh, Mr. Jason Beck, what do you have for us today? Oh, uh, Priscilla, I'm so honored to be your party spirit animal because no one, everyone knows that I turn up and turn out. So thank you so much for that. And my story today, let me pull this up because this is a fascinating headline where legal cannabis could become a 30 billion with a B U.S. industry in 2022. And here's where it will grow. At this point in cannabis timeline, it's it's simpler to count the number of U.S. states that haven't legalized the plant. It's 14 for the record. Then to totally... To, then to tally those that allow medical sales, uh, adult use sales, or both. And with that broad reach uh, came, came uh, a record-shattering green rush over the past two years, spurred by the COVID-19 pandemic as dispensaries were de- declared essential workforce businesses. These brands quickly invested in e-commerce and delivery tools and were flooded by stressed out homebound consumers looking to stock up on THC lace products. In 2020, that meant sales to the tune of 19.5 billion with a B per New Frontier data. Tallies for the 2021 are hovering around 25 billion with a B, another milestone. Giving into 2022, the growth shows no sign of stopping even without federal legalization. Research research firm BDSA Analytics estimates the U.S. will see a $30 billion with a B in legal sales for 2022, with Brightfield Group expecting the market to hit $50 billion by 2026. That's right, $50 billion with a B. While the legal cannabis industry still has an abundance of obstacles due to federal policy, which limits everything from banking availability to multi-state advertising, it's poised for tremendous growth in 2022, thanks in part to expanding state-by-state legalization uh, adoption among older demographics and the growth of product lines like THC-infused beverages and topicals. It's nearly impossible to overstate the size and stakes of the growth happening now, especially in populous states just opening their legal markets. For example, after legalizing adult use cannabis in 2020, Illinois, with an S, doubled its total sales in 2021. The state logged nine nine consecutive months of 100 million plus with an M in sales for an anticipated 1.87 billion with a B bottom line, according to New Frontier data. There were a few other topics in this article. There's a lot lot to cover. Some of the other main topics were uh, competing with a formidable opponent. Retailers are upping their game as they should be, and everyone needs to put more emphasis on data analytics and understanding the consumer journey, and will support be bipartisan. So I encourage you to check out this entire article, and this is Jason Beck reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. All right, let's keep smoking the news. (laughs) All right, so she's a former Capitol Hill Communications Director and founder of Phenoptic Strategies, and avid supporter of the Safe Banking Act. Up next, we got this State of Cannabis News Hour's very own Washington Insider, Gretchen Gailey. What you got for us this morning, Gretchen? Uh, well, good afternoon, Rico. My story uh, is coming from Canvas.net, and it's not really a story. It's actually an op-ed um, that says the headline is, Everyone has a plug, how accessibility is destroying the legal marijuana industry in America. Um, since we're limited, I won't go into that much of it, but basically... Everyone remembers how, you know, a few weeks ago, Californians were all coming out saying that higher taxes and fees and all that's killing the market, yada, 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 yada. Um, According to these folks, they say uh, that's only half the problem. 73% of the people getting their weed on the black market is bad for legal businesses. No taxes are being paid on illegal sales. No revenue is created to pay for those state marijuana licenses and no 
E code relief as a whole lot of fees for software banking and technology. The state has pledged $100 million to help figure out the cannabis industry, but that just tells half of the story of why the cannabis industry may have hit its first maturity point as an industry as a whole. For consumers, it was never about legalization. It was about accessibility. Uh, consumers are not worried about the legality of the tr their transaction. They are worried about price and accessibility. Yes, lab testing is nice, but not for the 50% marketing prices legal shops have to charge to pay for all those things like licenses, storefronts, technology, security, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a fascinating turn in the supply demand curve of the cannabis industry. Yes, everyone loves cannabis from the legal and illicit market, but supply is now starting to keep up with demand in many areas. Supply as a whole, including legal suppliers and illicit suppliers, seem to be filling the overall demand curve of local clientele. Plugs or cannabis suppliers are getting more local, more geocentric, as people don't want to get illegal packages in the mail and feel more comfortable buying local. Uh, this goes on and on, but basically says, you know, your your cousin with a card can get you some pot, um, that that is really what the problem is with what's going on in California, is that there is too much cannabis in these more mature markets like California and Colorado, um, and no one cares about like you said, lab testing and uh, trying to be legal. I think this is uh, kind of related to Liz's story, um, looking at what's happening in Louisiana where they only have two suppliers. Um, and they say, this is really what the problem is in California. And I'm wondering for our folks out there, um, especially Mr. Jason Beck, what they think of this, uh, this story. Well, Gretchen, I, I'll say, you know, one of the biggest things here in California is education. We have to, um, and, I work on that. A lot of people are working that. When you educate people, when the customer knows, yeah, they don't want to go to a session, get stuff that God knows has something that can, you know, has cyanide in it when it is combusted. So I think getting to people when they understand the benefits, yeah, and there's so many other elements to work on, but education, people going for brands they can trust. And, you know, we're maturing. This is a this market is so new. Look at the alcohol industry. There is still people making moonshine. That's still happening. 90 years after you know after that prohibition has been repealed so it's going to be here for a long time but we're on our way really so, shout out so, to Virginia. so well <laughs> said eric thank you for saying that uh it is education we've got to uh, also cancel people with irresponsible messaging uh but yeah that's surprising to me that people People don't care about their cannabis being lab tested, something that they're going to light on fire and put into their lungs. I don't believe that. I, I think they just don't understand. So let's keep on educating. That's what this show is all about. We've reached the top of the hour. Thank you so much, correspondents, for digging through the headlines every day and bringing us just what we need to know. Thank you, Priscilla and Rico, for co modding the room with me today, and Liz. And thank you, audience, for making us the stickiest show here on Clubhouse. If you missed any of the show, make sure and catch the replay or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can get the edited version later in the day. Thank you for, for uh, making this a great show, everybody. Susan, I totally agree with that article and the reality of it is that Americans and, and the general population doesn't care about testing You've the food that we all consume, of cannabis yet we over and over test the cannabis we in an inclusive and sustainable way. Maybe Start we should get a rim on, on that. And join us every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific time for the State of Cannabis Absolutely. News Hour, your daily dose. Get a room. Say goodbye, Rico. Goodbye.